Today's speaker for Constitution Day is President James Madison. President Madison is a well-accomplished man and leader. A native of Virginia, President Madison has served his country as a representative in the Virginia legislature, a member of Congress from Virginia, Secretary of State under President Jefferson, and as President of the United States, has served our country well. He is known as the defendant in one of the Supreme Court's greatest cases, Marbury versus Madison in 1803. President Madison was a primary author of the Federalist Papers and of the Bill of Rights. Historian Clinton Rossiter called the Federalist Papers the most important work in political science that has ever been written, or is ever likely to be written, in the United States. Madison was given the honor of being called the father of the Constitution by his colleagues in his own lifetime. His work is a model for many democracies and aspiring democracies around the world today. Today, President Madison will discuss the writing of the Constitution along with other topics. President James Madison, fourth president of the United States, welcome to the community colleges of Baltimore County. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Didi. Thank you indeed. It was the object of the convention in 1787 in Philadelphia to cherish and preserve the union of the states. After the declaration of independence in 1776 that dissolved the bonds between the 13 colonies and England, they considered themselves each sovereign states. And as sovereign states were the fundamental law in each state for their own people. In working in a consolidated fashion to, to thwart the efforts of the British in resisting our revolution, the 13 states confederated themselves into a league. And in this confederation of states agreed to 13 articles under which the states would work together to secure the independence from England and to promote the general welfare amongst themselves. It was this effort in 1776, the Articles of Confederation finally ratified in 1781, that proved to be so deficient to the general objects of not only the people at large, but the states collectively. And it is because of the inadequacies of the Articles of Confederation that the Convention of Philadelphia was called in order to readdress the nature of fundamental government in these United States. Fundamental government is essential to understanding the nature of the Constitution. The very term Constitution construes that that document is the fundamental law. And so it is difficult to have constitutions of 13 states and have a Constitution of the United States because each represents fundamental law. Now it is true that in forming this new government to replace the Articles of Confederation, one began to rely upon the genius of the people to form a government not composed of this respective states, but to compose a government that is reflective of the needs of all the people as represented in each of their own states. And it's this composition of a new government that is the subject of our deliberations today and was the result of that convention in 1787, which we call the Constitution of the United States. It was not an easy process to alter such a fundamental government of the American people and the American states. It was fraught with hazards, fraught with disagreements, fraught with, with people who held completely different concepts about what re Republican government should be. And it is this controversy that was the subject of our convention in Philadelphia for nearly four months. 
How do you form a Republican form of government that embraces the differences of 13 states and a variety of people from the upper reaches of Massachusetts and the District of Maine to the southern recesses of Georgia? And it is that alteration of fundamental government which was my concern. In 1784 and 85, when it was obvious that the Articles of Confederation were not were not effective. I began a study of confederations in general. I requested of my good friend Mr. Jefferson to send me various collections of books from Europe that might address this subject. And he sent me uh, nearly 200 works, actually over 200 works, far more than I had actually requested and at far greater expense than I could necessarily absorb. But in these works, and in my own library, to study the Confederated States of the Antionic League, the Lycian League, and the uh, Achaean League in Greece, the Kalmar League in Scandinavia, the Helvetic League in, in Switzerland, the Belvedic League in northern France, and the United States of Holland, these were all examples of confederated governments. And I was to ascertain that it was not necessarily our Articles of Confederation, but confederations in general that proved inadequate to the objects, the great objects of government, that is, the defense of the people and the promotion of the general welfare. And so then, ascertaining the deficiencies of the Articles of Confederation, the first object was to persuade other people of the deficiencies of the Articles of Confederation. And a host of incidents had occurred during the 1780s, which gave support to this assertion that the Articles of Confederation were inadequate to the needs of the new United States. In 1787, in contemplating this new convention being called, I began in May a, a, a writing of a number of, uh, of 15 articles that might serve as a plan of discussion for the new convention. It was introduced by Governor Randolph, the leading member by his position as governor of the Virginia delegation to that convention. It contained 15 articles which outlined a plan of government that altered the substance of the government from being run by states to run that was to operate on the American people directly. If state governments are primary governments, then a national government embracing states only as a confederation. If, however, the new government represents the people at large, then it is considered a consolidated government. A consolidated government would not have been accepted by the state legislatures in its pure form. And the federated government under the Articles of Confederation was inadequate in its form. So the Virginia Plan sought to embrace both the consolidated government and a federated government of the states. And so deriving this change, we explained it, I explained it, by suggesting that in the nature of its of its operation, the new national government was consolidated because it would address itself to those few subjects of a national character, the promotion of the national defense, promotion of, of, of prevention of domestic strife, domestic uprisings, and foreign incursions. And next, certainly the the establishment of the promotion of the general welfare, matters of trade amongst the states, trade abroad, matters of, of coinage, matters that concerned those areas of government that, that addressed all of the needs of the, all of the states, and particularly those needs of the national uh, group of, of states and people, and that the individual states themselves could not accomplish. In this respect, then, the new government was to address the very specific national subjects and to leave all other responsibilities to the respective states. 
in the formation of this government then in the convention for nearly four months, and there was a, a number of individuals, there were a number of individuals from various states that had the same object in mind to secure and promote the general welfare and to preserve the union of the states. How we should accomplish this in detail was the object of that convention. Most of the debates of the convention were conducted in committees of the whole. When the convention formed in late May of 1787, they determined the rules that each state in the convention would have one vote. But in the committee of the whole, the, uh, the representation was by each member. Votes in the committee of the whole would not in any way obligate the member to vote the same way when the assembly reverted to the convention format. So the convention convenes, meets as a convention, and immediately adjourns to what they call the committee of the whole. And then the committee of the whole is where many of the debates took place. The great controversy, the most preeminent controversy, was representation in the new government. I held in the Virginia plan that there should be two houses of government, but that both should be composed by members that are chosen on the basis of population and not equal representation. When the convention came to that issue in July, there were many objections from some of the smaller states. They suggested that their representations in the new Congress would be lessened if both houses were apportioned by population. But it stands to reason that a government in which the larger constituents, such as Virginia being the largest state, should have a greater proportion of the authority if it has a greater proportion of the contributions to that government. But this was not to be so. Now, with the uh, introductions of the, the New Jersey plan by Mr. Patterson in New Jersey, and support by other smaller states, Mr. Sherman from Connecticut and such, Mr. Johnson from Connecticut, and they had suggested that both houses in the New Jersey plan would be represented equally by each of the states. This was unsatisfactory to the rest of us, and particularly to myself. And the great compromise involved having one house chosen by population and the other by equal representation. And the Senate now is composed of two senators from each state chosen by state legislatures. And the House of Representatives is chosen by various methods in the states, generally by districts allotted by the states, dividing their states. Virginia had 10 representatives in the first Congress, and so made 10 congressional districts. And I occupied the position of one of those districts as congressman from Virginia in 1789. The other controversies were the nature of powers to be given to the legislative branch. And that addressed most of our initial concerns. What should the Congress have the power to do? And once the, the determination, the 18 responsibilities of the national government and the Congress, and then they had to address themselves to the executive branch. So many powers given to the congressional branch that it was necessary to enrich the powers of the president in order to counterbalance that of the legislative branch. A general reservation uh, certainly permeated much of the convention when they spoke of giving such powers to an executive. Many proposed that the executive branch should be composed of three or five individuals, and that no one person would embrace the executive role. But this was finally countermanded, and with the sub supposition that General Washington would become the new president of the United States, the single figure was to be proposed. Then how long would they serve? What is the nature of their service? And Congress determined that congressmen would be serving for two years and senators for six years on a rotating basis. 
president was proposed might serve one term for seven years. Perhaps, as Mr. Hamilton suggested, the president should be elected for life, which is tantamount to being a monarch. Mr. Hamilton made that proposal and then left the convention to return to New York and left many of us somewhat stunned in our seats that he would make such a proposal after our experiences with the monarch of England. But uh, that was quickly reverted, and the president was chosen for four-year terms. And uh, that seemed to be reasonable to most of the members. After the debates in the convention, and they were numerous, uh, everything from perhaps the, the nature of uh, composition of the Congress to their terms, to the responsibilities, what, what qualifications they would require. And these uh, matters were also uh, to be contrasted with uh, small instances. When the debates turned to the Article I, the, the, the powers of the Congress, the decision was made in the General Convention that, that the power should be enumerated, but it wasn't certain what that enumeration should be. And in the course of debates through the course of the summer, we, we changed from several subjects and reverted back to earlier subjects, revisited early subjects, addressed them, voted on them, and then returned to them later on. But such an issue in Article 1, Section 1, read that the powers of the national government of the Congress was to institute duties and tariffs, imports, and excises on the people that would have the power to do that, the power to tax. But at the end of that phrase in the convention, and when the issue went to the Committee of Detail to, to actually write down these resolutions, Governor Morris from Pennsylvania wrote down the four powers of taxing and then concluded it with a semicolon, and it said, and all matters pertinent to the defense of the country and the promotion of the general welfare. And this promoting the general welfare and providing for the general defense of the nation with a semicolon before it actually, in effect, would give the powers of the Congress to make all laws concerning national defense and promoting the general welfare. And all the 17 powers that would follow that in Article 1 would be useless because in that first section of Article 1, the nature of the power of the Congress would be preeminent over the nation. And some discussion was made, and I know General, uh, Mr. Sherman uh, from Connecticut had pointed out this, the effects of that semicolon. As a consequence, the semicolon was removed and that statement to promote the general welfare and promote the, provide for the general defense was also removed from section one. It was reintroduced later. And the reason for reintroducing it later is because the Articles of Confederation contained a clause that set the purpose of the national government to provide for the common defense and promote the general welfare. And so, that phrase now appears in Article I, Section 1 of the Constitution and is preceded by a comma rather than a semicolon. These kinds of issues, even to the matters of semantics, grammar, punctuation, had everything to do with rendering that Constitution adequate, at least, to the minds of the members of that convention. After that work was completed, and we completed it on the 17th of September, 1787, it was then sent to the, to the United States and Congress assembled. It was meeting under the dictates of the Articles of Confederation. And it was sent to that group that they might receive it as a report. Indeed, in the Congress in New York, there was no mention of the Constitution. It was a report of the convention in 1787 in Philadelphia that they received. And it was decided by the convention, not by the Congress, that the Constitution should be sent to the several states and it should be ratified, not by the state legislatures,
but by the people, by conventions of the people, choosing their own deputies to that convention. This is a fundamental change in the fundamental government of the United States. It was prefaced by the, by the Declaration of Independence, but given substance by that convention in 1787. And this is the one tie that binds all people of the United States together. With a circumstance of language, circumstance of religion, circumstance of profession, trade, circumstance of uh, living, circum uh, living circumstances, uh, relations, identities with such organizations as the Masons or the Society of Cincinnati. None of those so binds the people of the United States together as the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution represents a considered opinion of what best Republican government can be secured, not only in theory, but also in practice. The Constitution guarantees a Republican form of government for all the people of the United States, not only by the, the Constitution itself, but in their own state constitutions, and becomes a fundamental law. There are issues that arose in the ratifying conventions, particularly one that it lacked a Bill of Rights, and the second that it gave too much power to tax to the federal government. Mr. Monroe, a very good friend of mine, suggested in the Richmond Convention, ratifying convention in 1788, that the new government ought to allow the states to gather monies from the people to contribute to the general government and the states were unable to do so, then the general government could tax the people. This is cumbersome, and uh, it's obvious that if the states could not gather the money, is that the federal government could not gather them afterwards either. The power to tax, the power of the purse, is fundamental to every fundamental government. It should not be relied upon the states to secure the taxes for the federal revenues but rather to endow that federal government with the power to tax the people directly. In 1811, during my administration, there are no excise taxes upon the people generally. It's not necessary. Mr. Washington's administration administered an excise tax through the devices and through the efforts of uh, Mr. Hamilton, the Secretary of the Treasury in 1790. Mr. Hamilton proposed a financial, pro uh, financial program that involved the the excise tax, the assumption bill, the funding bill, and the assumption bill. And this program of finance, including the excise tax, was levied before the American people, and particularly in the form of the excise tax, a particular issue of the excise tax led to the rebellion in Western Pennsylvania in 1794, 1795. Objections, objections of the people in Western Pennsylvania, Western Maryland, Western Virginia, for a tax on molasses and on spiritus liquors, a tax that was applied because the excise bill, presumably in its form in taxing liquors, taxed everyone equally. Everyone drank liquor. But the tax was not levied at the point of sale. It was levied at the point of production. And those small distillers could not pay the tax prior to selling the whiskey. And upon examination for this and other issues, the excise bill became quite a remarkable representation of an unfair tax on the American people. These uh, ratifying conventions that brought up the issues of a Bill of Rights and of the power to tax, the essential objections to the Constitution, were to be resolved in the matter of taxation it was argued that only the national government could and should levy taxes upon the American people directly, not upon the states. And the issue of a Bill of Rights, uh, quite an issue, quite surprising to me, the Bill of Rights, an enumeration of rights, has little history in the context that we know the Bill of Rights today. The 
precedent in 1789 in English law offered a, a bill of rights that was a restriction on what the king could do to the parliament in terms of the powers of the parliament. In the several colonies, a, uh, an evolution of rights of Englishmen had developed over a 150-year period. And even Mr. Colonel Mason of Virginia had introduced such a Bill of Rights for Virginia in the formation of the Constitution of Virginia in 1776. But eight of the 13 states, or only eight of these 13 states, actually had any references to a Bill of Rights in their own constitutions after the de Declaration was declared. Five of the states had no reference at all. Some of those eight states had the reference to a Bill of Rights in a separate section. Others had them included in the Constitution. Others had them evolved by statutory law, laws made by their respective legislatures. So the idea of a Bill of Rights at the national level was not necessarily an all-pervasive point of view. Secondly, to what do we need a Bill of Rights? It is to protect us against the obtrusion, presumably in the minds of many people, the obtrusion of government into the private lives of individuals. We have natural rights that are vested in us at birth prior to the formation of any government. And we form ourselves into societies of individuals in order to protect those natural rights. We compose civil rights to protect our natural rights. But what is the likely source of an intrusion on personal rights? It comes from those governments that are plenary in nature. Under the Articles of Confederation, the states were the plenary powers, merely in league with one another in a confederation, but each state had its own sovereign authority over its people. It had plenary powers to do whatever it chose to do as long as the people accepted it. The new national government, the new constitution, was a government of limited powers. Why restrict the national government not to obtrude upon the right of a free press if there was nothing in the Constitution that allowed the government to do anything about a free press? If, as the example was given in the Virginia Ratifying Convention, if I have a thousand dollars, a thousand acres to sell, and I sell 500 of them, is it necessary to declare that I retain the right of the other 500 acres? It is not. And in so vesting the national government with certain authorities, it is not necessary to list that which you cannot do if it's not given the power to do it in the first place. So dangers to rights of individuals come more from plenary governments than from limited governments. It is also to believe that real intrusion on rights doesn't really come from government at all. It comes from the power of majority that acts in a tyrannical faction, fashion. So in writing the Constitution, we try to compose it in such a way that no one majority will retain its particular composition on a constant basis. It is the idea of factions that, that form and act in different combinations with one another that provide a transitory majority. The majority will always prevail, so it's necessary that the compositional majority never remains the same. And uh, issues about this, uh, this majority rule and the obtrusion of, of personal rights is a fundamental question of government. I did not wish for a Bill of Rights to be added to the Constitution, but with a compelling response to the various state ratifying conventions for a Bill of Rights, I thought it would be acceptable to include an enumeration of rights as long as it would not endanger the fundamental structure of the government. And upon examination of the subsequent amendments to the Constitution, now we refer to as a Bill of Rights, 
It is important to note that they are not an assertion of what the rights of the individuals are. The nature of those amendments merely restrict what the government cannot do in respect to the citizens, not necessarily what the extent of each individual citizen's rights might be. And that is an important precept to understand, that you do not wish to write a, an array of amendments that list the rights of individuals because such a list, if incomplete, would merely imply that the federal government can do anything which is not listed in such an enumeration. If, however, you write such an enumeration of restrictions to the national government onto what areas of civil life the government cannot act for individuals, then you see that it's a limitation on the government rather than an extension of the rights of the individuals. And this is what we attempted to do with the Bill of Rights. I uh, should end this disquisition before you. There are so many details that give substance to each comment made that in their deliberation would extend this session far longer than we have to, to address. And so I open myself to questions. I would wish, however, that each of you, when leaving this room, may appreciate that when a people divest themselves of an authority, as we did the King of England, and hope to establish a new form of government predicated upon sovereignty of the people at large, that this, number one, is so fundamental that there is nothing in the annals of mankind that precede it to vest authority in the people in general rather than in one individual of a king or sordid individuals as some plutocracy or parliament or some theocracy, but that the fundamental nature of government, the fundamental element of law is predicated upon the genius of the American people, that it will prevail in all matters of strife, in all matter of public, civil, economic strife, that the people will prevail and their collective wisdom will guide this nation, that we need no need of a dictator or a tyrant, that we can rely upon the American people in general. And the second premise is, if the people are to act together, what is it that binds them together? And upon acute examination, one will realize that the only fundamental element that binds the American people together, no single culture, no single religion, no single language, no single talent, no single location, the only thing that binds them together is this Constitution. So an examination of that document and a revisiting of that document the revisiting of that document in light of the American experience and the application of the Constitution should occupy the attentions of all tradesmen, all yeomen, all lawyers, all doctors, all individuals within the embrace of the American experience. And upon acute examination without reservation and the openness of such a debate, the questioning of such measures, such doctrines. This is what gives vitality to the American people. It's not the living nature of the Constitution. It's the living nature of the, of the people at large who are the sovereigns of that government that is now organized under the Constitution. May I invite some questions, if any of you have any? My abilities to see have been uh, lessened by the course of the war in public service. You forgive me. Yes, sir. Back in 1776, would you believe that America would last 230 years in democracy? Well, the supposition it would last a thousand years and perhaps longer than the Roman Republic. 
the uh, the spirit of the American people at that time in 1775 and 1776. I imagine that people who are born after that time cannot know it. When signers of the Declaration of Independence are committing their lives and their fortunes and their sacred honor, these are not words. These are words that represent far more powerful elements in the personal lives of men. I should ask any one of you, are you willing to relinquish the comforts of your own home, of your own wealth? Are you willing to relinquish your life for principle? There are certainly soldiers who do this every day. They're on the, they're on the edge between life and death for matters of principle at least fundamentally. And I'm not sure in the comfort here in 1811 how many people are willing to sacrifice their lives, to sacrifice their fortunes, their farms, their, their businesses, their trades, to give it up. And the prospects of success loomed rather dim. English, the English were the largest army and navy in the world at the time. Superior in every way to that we had United States had had. The collective states had a, a long coastline, no navy, no army. And not all the people were united in the principles of independence. The prospects did not look good for independence. And the only thing that could persuade people to act on the matter was the sense of principle. And this principle is represented in the statement of those who signed the Declaration of Independence that they would give up their lives and their fortunes and their sacred honor. Each of us who adhered to that revolution were in a sense writing our names to sacrifice our lives and our fortunes and our sacred honor. It's an extraordinary step. If I say the name Benedict Arnold to any one of you here, what does it mean to you, sir, Benedict Arnold? What does the name imply? Traitor. Traitor. There's a gentleman whose sacred honor now may be engrafted on the statements of minds of people for generations that every Arnold might be suspected to be a relative of Benedict Arnold. And the sacred honor disgraced for years and years and years. How do you rectify that? That's sacred honor. Any one of those men signing the declaration could have been captured and could have been hung on, the, on sight without trial. I rest my case. We had the prospects it would last, but out of principle, not out of any hope that it actually could be accomplished. Any other questions? Yes. Well, one principle I wanted very emphatically was that a commission be established to review the laws of the states. And uh, this did not come about in the final element of the Constitution. When we had written that the Constitution would be the supreme law of the land, that implied that all state laws had to be congruent to the national Constitution. And so my desire to have a, a a commission of individuals to con constantly judge the laws passed by the states to make sure that they were congruent with the Constitution was not necessary. Uh, at the time, I would have liked that to have been changed. I still hold that the Congress should have been composed of a, pro a proportional representation in both houses. But um, I opposed the National Bank in 1790 and actually supported the rechartering of the National Bank last year in 1810. Uh, there is room for growth. As Mr. Jefferson has liked to say, the clothes that a boy wears at 14 cannot be the same clothes that he wears at the age of 40. 
We have to constantly change. The Constitution was the supposition of how a good Republican government should be formed and operate. It is a collection of ideas of many men rather than any one man. It's the work of many heads and many hands. And to call me the father of the Constitution, as some have done, is a misrepresentation, uh, not only perhaps of the fact, but of historical consequence. Many members helped to compose that Constitution. Uh, there is little, perhaps, that I would change of a grand nature. No, I suspect that there's nothing I would change now. Yes, in the, cor in the corner? Do you think you and the other kind of father, kind of father who look at today's U.S. government would be proud or satisfied with the direction of politics and the United States has been going? It's nothing to do with the President of the United States here in 1811, I can assure you that I am rather proud by the fact that it's continued for 22 years. There are uh, changes that have occurred in the operations of the government, but um, um, there's opposition now in Congress in 1811. New members have been elected that wish to advocate war either with England or France here in 1811. But when the issues came before Congress to allocate monies or to support loans for the augmentation of our own army and navy, they were reluctant to offer it. They ask for war, but do little to support those measures that may prepare us for war. They advocate attentions either to England or attentions to France. Um, but this government cannot necessarily ally itself either with England or France in any formal way until England and France take those actions which we redress our grievances of both of those nations regards the limitations of American neutral trade. This general sentiment in the nation here in 1811 seems in one respect to move toward and in another respect not to prepare for it. This administration has sought to avoid war with either England or France and to employ diplomatic measures to redress our grievances with those nations. In the process, we must work with a Congress that only during the 11th Congress, at the end of the 11th Congress, refused to recharter the National Bank. That refusal to recharter the National Bank in 1811 left an obligation of $13 million that was outstanding of that bank to several state banks, including that of Maryland. And so the failure to recharter the, the bank is an obvious measure of the Congress not to address itself to the concerns that are extant in this nation just now. The 12th Congress was scheduled to meet in December of this year in 1811. Before leaving Washington City on the 24th of July, I issued a proclamation calling for that Congress to meet in November rather than December because there are issues that are pertinent to the national welfare that cannot wait till December to address. If there is a dissatisfaction perhaps in the nation today, it's for the political element, not for the fundamental constitutional element. Does that answer your question? That's a short answer. Yes, you lean in front. Um, do you believe that, or did you think that people understood that the 10th Amendment was written to be in conflict with the original Constitution? And how do you mean in conflict? You mean that in the Constitution it says that the federal government is not in conflict with all laws which shall be necessary to properly carry into execution for God's power, and all other power does Well, for, for one thing, 
the federal government, the national government that's established by the Constitution. The foundation of that national government and what renders it national by its nature is not that it has plenary powers over all the people and all the states. The new national government was formed that it would have complete power over those issues which are of a national character that no one state or group of states could address themselves. In matters of national defense, we could not depend upon the state of Rhode Island to protect the state of Virginia. And in some respects then, there are issues amongst the 13 states that require a consolidated government to address those national issues. In addressing those national issues of a consolidated nature, the federal government must be vested with all powers necessary and proper to perform that function. One cannot presume what those powers must be. And so we say necessary and proper in order to afford the national government that authority to act on those national issues. The Tenth Amendment merely reiterates the nature of the national government as opposed to the, uh, the several states. And it merely asserts that in those issues in which the national government is not authorized to act, that is, those issues which are not of a national character, are reserved to the state governments. So if, if one is to consider that the national government has plenary powers over all matters, over all things, then you're right, there's a contradiction there. But under the presumption, and under the natural presumption, that the national government is only acting in those areas of national concern, and that the, the Tenth Amendment merely reassures the states that, that there are elements of state authority that are beyond the scope of the national government to address. And that way, it's, it's merely an assertion of a clarification rather than ambiguity. Yes, sir. Well, Rhode Island, under the Articles of Confederation, was a singular state in obstructing almost all things that the Articles of Confederation and the League were able to accomplish. In some issues in the Articles of Confederation, it required a unanimity of all the states. If Rhode Island was absent, which it frequently was, the unanimity would not be there, and thus the action could not be taken. In other measures, the, uh, the abstaining of one state could obstruct the, uh, the natural flow of things. So if Rhode Island voted against it, even if it was president, present, it could obstruct the, the, the Congress under the Articles of Confederation. When the various uh, states were called together in general convention in Philadelphia in 1787, Rhode Island was singular in not attending. They voted against attending. Rhode Island was singular that in ratifying the Constitution was distributed, they did not wish to ratify the Constitution was first presented to their state. Indeed, it took them, I believe, until 17, the later part of 1790 to ratify the Constitution and to accept it. They sought to secure a payment to Rhode Island from the national government of outstanding debts. There, there are matters that arose in Rhode Island that are the reasons why we call it often Rogue Island as a consequence. And I'm sure that you're not necessarily pretending to Rhode Island, but rather to a small state. Yes, sir, I do. I feel that it would be necessary for the state to suggest that in those issues that are of a national character, that the uh, representations in the Congress uh, should be by proportion. And the reason for that is those issues of our national character are of a national character because they act upon the people generally, not on the states. And if you are uh, causing a government to be constructed whose sovereignty is predicated upon the people generally, and for the purposes is to operate upon the people generally, and those particular issues that require operations on the people generally, then all representation in that new government should also reflect the proportions of those people. Uh, and I, I believe in that respect then that the national government being limited in scope of authority should then be composed by proportional representation of both houses. Yes.
should follow any American individual abroad? Well, in the case of, of, of those, and it has been an evolving element of embassies and representations, formal representations of a country, yes, unequivocally, it should follow them. Any representative, formal uh, authorized representative of the United States should fall under the umbrella of, Brit of, of, of an authority that's not only American in nature, it's generally international in nature. Uh, but uh, in the matters of, uh, uh, no, it does not embrace those individuals who subject themselves to the laws of other nations in traveling abroad. But I would suggest that there may be other individuals from abroad who come to the United States who by coming to this place, either in visitation or to residency, are embraced by the Constitution, yes. It is not that the American law would necessarily apply to citizens who are abroad and beyond the scope of the American jurisdiction, but those individuals who come within the American jurisdiction fall within the umbrella of the Constitution, yes. Is that clear? Good. While I have hazarded your attention considerably, I see that as so many delegates to the National Convention had taken leave prior to 17th of September in 1787, that a few of our number have found themselves by domestic obligations required to address their particular issues as well. For those remaining, and for those few blank faces that address me just now that give some evidence of an inability to comprehend that which I've already said, I can assure you this is far more difficult for me to say than it is for any of you to understand. I uh, celebrate your perseverance, your attentions to such a worthy subject. It is uh, almost clinical in nature uh, to, uh, to address those issues that involve the body politic. And for those individuals who remain here and those who have been so persevering over the years, uh, I can only celebrate that it is the American genius that makes this new American government so successful. We had an old saying from once I came in Montpelier in Orange County when I vacillated and uh, perhaps was reluctant to engage in a chore that my father had given me. He reminded me that in times of vacillation and procrastination, there are two ways to get to the top of an oak tree, that one can either climb it or sit on an acorn and wait. I thank you for your attention today.